Okay, well, good morning, everybody. I'm Katrina Cannon. I'm Associate Director of the Bodleian Libraries here in Oxford. My colleague Linda um, is going to pick up for me seven, seven and a half minutes after me, so we're going to share our, share our 15 minutes. Um, and what we're really going to focus on is the implications for Oxford as a research university of the recent developments in open access that we've seen. Um, I'm going to talk about the wider implications of open access for Oxford policy-wise and the structures that we've put in place to support our researchers. Um, then Linda's going to pick up and she's going to talk about the support that, that the subject librarians in the University of Oxford libraries are, are picking up um, and those are our traditional link with the academics. So firstly, <coughs> what does open access mean for a research intensive university like Oxford? First, uh, firstly, I'd like to just say why I, why I think I'm here. As I said, I'm, I'm an associate director in the, in the libraries, the Bodleian libraries. I sit on the university's cross-departmental working group on open access, which we started just as the, as the Finch Group report was coming out and the recommendations we were trying to put into place in the university. And it includes um, researchers, open access, uh, sorry, academic departments and divisions, the libraries, the OUP, who are an important part of, of what we do here at the university, and the university's administration and services, including research services, who are leading in this area. And one of my responsibilities in the libraries is scholarly communications. So I'm, I lead on the journal subscriptions, and that means that I'm also going to lead on the payment of article processing charges. So my first bit of what I'm going to talk about is mainly about gold open access, um, but we are going to touch on green open access in a bit. So what does open access mean for research intensive universities? Well, from a library perspective, I, I'm going to start with the more negative concerns, um, but I will move on to the positives as I see them of greater openness. Um, but if, we go, if we're going to move into a gold open access world, world of gold open access, um, cost is a major consideration for, for libraries and for universities. If it's gold, then you pay to succeed. The articles that are accepted are paid for. So a university like Oxford that has a high acceptance rate is going to end up paying quite a lot. So my, my, my proposal to publishers and to people here really is to say, um, in, a, in a world where we do pay APCs, why not pay a submission charge? Um, because when I talk to publishers, what they say to me is, the biggest cost is peer review. That's always what they say, you know, everything else we can streamline, we can make cheaper, but peer review is the greatest cost. So you have to peer review something, whether you're going to accept it or whether you're going to reject it. So why not have a submission charge, which everybody would be charged, and then it would be more evenly spread. Um, then the other thing, which is what my slide is referring to, is the potential cost of gold open access for a university like Oxford. And what I've done is I've pilled, pulled out our figures from 2011-12 because those are the ones I can say with greater certainty. But our materials budget, which accounted for books, journals, and databases, so whether print or e-journals, um, we had 5.7 million in 2011-12, which is high for the UK, not so high com in comparison to US libraries. And of that, we spent about four million on e-resources, which would be mainly our big e-journal packages. In the same year, we estimate that the output of Oxford in terms of our articles, research articles, was 13,000. So if we take the average cost of an APC, a journal, uh, journal submission charge, at the, at the rate that the Finch report gives it, which is 1,750, that gives a potential of over 20, nearly 23 million for Oxford in terms of, of how much it would cost. So that's just something that we have in the back of our heads as you know, one of the implications of open access. It is very hard, I should say, to calculate the cost of open access. What I've done is an entirely open access world where we paid for everything. But um, we have tried to work with the statistics unit in Oxford to calculate what the possibilities might be. 
and we've been a it's very hard to be very definite about these things but we've modeled we've done three different different models and the lowest end of the market we've got about 2 million and then at the highest end around the 20 million mark so you can see it's it's one of these things that's quite hard to calculate so then I move on to the more positive aspects of open access um, from a scholarly communication point of view. And I think it's very important that we do all recognize that the model for scholarly communications is changing. And those of you who are researchers and publishers will know that as well or better than I do. The growing importance of data, the new models of publishing other than journals and monographs, even in the humanities you're seeing different, different models for publishing. Um, we've just heard about how peer review is being experimented with and the fact that there has been the, P the Finch group, that there has been recognition of the government and agreement with most of their recommendations and that then it's been backed up by money and policies from, um, from the research councils acknowledges the fact that things are changing and it gives it government sanction and that ultimately I think is helpful for the academy. And, um, the best thing I've read so far on this, um, which those of you who are scientists will probably know better than I do, but the best thing I've read on open access so far is this Royal Society report, um, Science as an Open Enterprise. And it talks mainly about the data side of things, but it does really, it goes back over the history of, of publishing and then um, in the sciences, and then it, it, it sort of talks about where we are now and how we need to adapt to, 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 to take that into account. It focuses a lot on data, but I think you can't get away from that when you're talking about open access. From a library point of view, um, this isn't so much of an issue in the sciences, but we are still moving from print to electronic in the provision of scholarly communications in the libraries. And you cannot go open access without being electronic. So it helps us in the move from, electronic, from print to electronic. And then finally, from a university perspective, a university like Oxford didn't necessarily have a lot of management information on the publishing output of the university and the scholarly communications output of the university. And so this gives us an opportunity to gather more data about what we're doing. Um, and in fact, we have to do it for the research councils, but it's a good opportunity for the university to know more about what we're doing and to be able to use that stati those statistics and that management information to plan a bit more. And of course, it's a chance as well for us to give more of a, to put more of a focus on our institutional repository, the Oxford Research Archive, uh, which we've had for quite some time, but this gives it a, a, an, a renewed position as the institutional record for the university. So because I, as I said, I'm in charge of the, bud the budget, budget uh, materials budget, the journal subscriptions for the library, but I'm also going to be in charge of the APC payments. I thought it would be interesting to hear, for you to hear a little bit about how universities like Oxford are going to help their authors in managing the funds and in, a, in um, complying with the RCUK. We have a website and um, the author of the website is here, Shan Dodd from Research Services. Um, the Open Access website, uh, Open o Access Oxford website, which you've probably seen, and um, we have a statement on open access in that on that page. Um, and most universities have this. Um, it's it's useful for us because it um, tells people outside the university what we're trying to achieve, but it also um, gives us direction within the university to have an overall policy that's been agreed. So that's something you can have a look at if you wish to see it more. We also have an allocation policy for the money that we've received from the research councils for open access. And you'll be aware that we had some pump priming money, but we're also getting some more money, which is to start from the 1st of April um, uh, for, for payment of open access fees. Um, we have an allocation policy in draft, and we are prorating the block grant according to the research councils, and we're dividing it into three month blocks. We're encouraging authors to go green and use the, res the repository, but we will pay APCs where necessary. Um, and the applications will be signed off by the head of department. And in terms of the, th the theme of the conference, that's um, one of the ways that we are trying to guarantee the st academic standards within Oxford is to make sure that, op that academic departments heads are actually signing off the, signing off the applications. Um, 
we are trying to work on our repository to make it easier to submit and also to import data from external sources and onto um, the research data, uh, research things like um, ROS and research fit fish for reporting to the research councils. So I think I'm finished now. So. Yes, can you hear me? <laughs> right. Um, I'd just like to uh, carry on from there. I'm a medical, one of the medical subject librarians in the Bodmin, and uh, I'm here really to talk about what, in my interpretation of the topic, is that I'm actually going to talk about how we can facilitate a more rigorous adoption of the open access publication policy of the university. Um, right. Subject librarians and open access. First thing that happened is that you might think to yourself, why do librarians have any, um, why are they stakeholders in this? Well, obviously, as um, Katrina's just said, we're very concerned about journal subscriptions. And as a subject librarian, I can tell you, we're the first person that you come to when somebody says, why haven't you got this journal? <laughs> and it, you know, quite often they don't understand that it costs such a lot of money. Um, and the second thing is, of course, the Bodleian has been running the Oxford Research Archive for a number of years. and this is something that we need, as Katrina says, to um, make better, and it has, this is going to be a very key part of the university um, open access policy. The other side of it is that we were very aware that Oxford academics weren't terribly, I mean, I'm talking to the converted few probably here, but actually when you start talking to Oxford academics, open access isn't a big worry to them at the moment. <laughs> I think it might become more of such. Um, we noticed that because we weren't getting the amount of material being deposited in the Oxford Research Archive that we'd have liked. Um, that's evidenced by the fact that we only had mandatory um, deposit of defills um, since about 2008. Uh, and the rest of it's very much dependent on individuals um, being keen on open access or departments being keen on open access. And, but, but that is growing. The last ref exercise with um, transferring records for to um, Symplectic to uh, to our open to Aura has meant that at least we've got some of the content, but we haven't actually got the full text for everything. Um, but this is a big change, which I think is going to happen with the university changing to its open access policy. Um, so the librarians were asked because. Uh, we already have existing liaison and communication channels with the academics, so we were asked if we would try and proselytise open access policies. And so the subject librarians in particular were asked if they would start giving a whole set of pre presentations across the university, which m m my fellow um, medical librarian and I, we were the stupid ones that stuck our hands up and that's how we ended up doing it. And that's probably because medical librarians have been much more aware of open access for, than a lot of others across the way. Um, but uh, so we have been doing that. We have been giving sessions and telling people very generally about um, what's happening in Oxford. We have had individual um, departmental and faculty uh, meetings with uh, various academics to tell them about what's happening in Oxford. And the other thing we have been doing is that the, um, the website that Katrina mentioned, Open Access at Oxford, is a joint venture with us and the research services. And, the, and as you'll see, one of the things that we have been doing is, and on the next slide, is backing up the online help that's available from the website. We have librarians, about 40 or 50 of us actually, who um, man the live help. Um, it, it's not as, um, that sounds like we're being terribly over prescriptive. We already have a solo live help, which is our catalog like help, and we're using the same staff to do similar things. But that means that we, anybody can actually, during nine to five, Monday to Friday, can actually uh, type in a quick question into the live chat box and they, 
questions will be triaged. If we can answer them, we do. If not, we send them to the right people within the university to, to, to co copy them. And the other side of it is when we're not there, we also, um, a large number of us are on the open access inquiries and we're running the, um, that from all the time really, um, but we're trying to have a quick turnaround of, um, results. So we're using that plus the FAQs that are on the, um, the website and so we're contributing to web, the facts and anything that we comes up with we're hoping to cover in the facts as well. So it, it's growing and it's becoming more and more um, evident that this is going to be a need as more and more people are aware of what's, what's happening within in the open access community. Right, and the last thing, of course, is that the subject librarians have been um, coming up to speed with, sub <laughs> with their subject specific advice. Obviously, we're all on a very st steep learning curve about all of the things that are listed on my slide, funder requirements, creative common licenses, and I'm sure there's a lot of people that are a bit hazy about creative common licenses, and I think that's an area where librarians will be able to help publisher policies, institutional policies, golden green routes, and deposit in subject and institutional repositories. All these things subject librarians are getting to grips with and explaining to people wherever possible about the bits and pieces they need to know. And we're obviously using the tools that are available and um, the sorts of things that um, we're doing, I mean, the subject librarians in their own subject areas are finding their all the journal policy, publishers' policies and journal title policies for the open access. We're trying to support the university's um, encouragement of green route where possible, but obviously, uh, for me in medicine, uh, it's going to be more gold than green. <laughs> um, but we are trying to make it possible that people know what the options are. And so gradually, I think the subject librarian's expertise, it'll be more and more like Librarians have always been asked about copyright. Not that we're lawyers, but it's just that the people that, and I suspect that a lot of these things that librarians will become a, somewhere that you can go to and check on, you know, some, uh, the interpretation of which particular publisher says about what. I think there will be more and more librarians having to do this on a regular basis, so they'll have a, a, a nice basis of knowledge for all those bits and pieces. And I think that's really all I've got to say, is apart from to say that actually, I feel that um, this is all going to be very, very tame, very, very quickly. It's, it's open data that's going to matter. And, um, and I think that open data, as, as um, Sir Mark Walpott said, is going to be our next area to move into, because actually it's librarians um, knowledge managers, whatever you want to call them, who are, you know, are going to be helping with that metadata and helping with the storage and vitally making it so that it's user friendly to actually extract the data. And I think that's where, where librarians in the future will be moving.